Hello, welcome along to the Fun Kids Science Weekly, the podcast that lets you actually explore. Explore right now, explore even though you're stuck at home. We go places, we go on adventures, we learn all the most amazing stuff that's out there in the universe. This week, we'll get all our random science questions answered with the genius Steve Mould, and we'll be talking to him about which animals use science the best to get by. Also, we'll learn all about a deadly sea snake whose venom could wipe out three people at a time. And we'll talk about why scientists are trying to save mosquitoes. It's all on the way. First, let's catch up with one of our favourite geniuses on the podcast. This is Professor Hallux. Professor Hallux's Pathology Puzzles with the Royal College of Pathologists. That was pretty gruesome. Cutting open that dead body and putting all the squishy bits in jam jars. I know you like pathology, but that TV show is... Well, it's all a bit too icky, if you ask me. It's just a TV show, and remember that it's forensic pathology. That's just one type of puzzle solving. Most pathology is much less... Well, less dramatic. Look, check out this case study. See here, Josh is 11. He's complaining to his mother that he's had a bad pain in his right side and feels quite sick. His mother notices that he has a slight fever and remembers he did not eat breakfast that morning, nor has he eaten his packed lunch. So even his mum is looking at the evidence, just like the pathologists do. That's right. And she thinks that this isn't normal for Josh. Time to go and see a doctor. The thing is, Josh is in so much pain when the doctor examines him that Josh's mum is told to take him to hospital. The evidence is mounting up for it being something quite serious by the look of it. Exactly. At the hospital, a sample of blood is taken and examined by the haematology department. Haematologists are special kind of pathologists who look at blood samples. They can see that there are more white blood cells than normal. A sign, which when combined with other symptoms, suggests that Josh might have acute appendicitis. Well, that's nice that it's cute, but hardly the right time to be paying compliments. Acute, not cute. This means Josh is going to need an operation to remove his appendix. Not with a chainsaw, in a perfectly simple operation. And once the appendix is removed, it will be sent to the anatomical pathology department so they can take a closer look just to make sure there is no evidence of other problems. Pathology solves the case, and all without any chainsaws. Professor Halix's Pathology Puzzles with the Royal College of Pathologists. Find out more at funkislive.com slash Halix. Right, time for one of my favourite parts of the show. It's where I answer all of your science questions, the ones that you have left for me as a review over on Apple Podcasts. Uh, we'll ask uh, Steve Mould, who's coming on the show a little bit later on, actually, one of your one of your questions. So if you've left one there, stick around. Uh, first, this is from uh, someone called The Wonder of Sound. I did ask for quite inventive names over on Apple Podcasts. That is a brilliant one. Uh, they ask, how does a fan keep you cold? Uh, like an office fan, I guess, a fan with a motor behind a cage. Uh, you see, when the blades spin, they force air to move off in different directions, which circulates the air that's all around you. Now, when you're hot, the air that's right close by, it tends to get quite still, quite still and muggy, doesn't it? Which makes it hard for your sweat to cool you down. It won't it really evaporate that well. It's got nowhere to go. But when the air that is near you is replaced by cool air, the sweat brings your body heat away into the cold air, which then cools you down. Thank you so much for that question. This is from Leo G, who asks how helium makes your voice go higher. I think we've touched about this on the podcast before, but always worth go- going over some of the most amazing sciencey stuff. Leo, it's really simple. When you make a sound, it has to travel through air that surrounds your vocal cords. They vibrate to make the noise. Now, helium is a much lighter gas 
than the air that's normally around your vocal cords, which is oxygen and nitrogen that you breathe in normally. Uh, So when you breathe in the helium now, it makes the sound travel much faster over that gas. And high speeds make high frequency, which makes a higher pitch. Thanks for that, Leo. Lastly today, we've got one from Dragon Lover Elisa. Told you, I love my amazing names. You need to leave yours on the Apple Podcast Store. Uh, Elisa asks, how big is the universe? Well, we know that the universe is is pretty much constantly expanding. It's getting bigger, like blowing up a balloon. Uh, So in that way, I, I guess it's kind of infinite. But if you want an almost proper answer, there is something that we know of called the observable universe. It holds all the matter that we can see from down here on Earth and up in space using telescopes and probes that are floating all around. And scientists have done loads of studies using those to think, and they think it is 93 billion light years across. Let's put that in perspective. A light year is how much distance light travels in a year. And bear in mind, light travels 186,000 miles a second. So if you do the maths, that means it travels about 5.8 trillion miles in a year. So it's that 93 billion times. (laughs) Uh, 93 billion times 5.8 trillion miles. That's how big the universe is. Thank you so much for the questions. If you've got something that you want answered on the show, you need to leave it for me as a review over on Apple Podcasts. It's the Fun Kids Science Weekly. Now, friend of the show, super scientist Steve Mould, has got a brand new book out. It's called Wild Scientists. Uh, It's all about the science that animals use every single day to just get by. And he's on the show now to tell us more. Hey, Steve. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, really well. Uh, I've been thinking, since we're stuck at home, what science can we do right now? What what can we make the most of science-wise while we're indoors or maybe while we're in our back gardens? Is there anything and is is there any natural phenomena that we can see? Is there any experiments that we can try out while we've got this time? Yeah, there's so much stuff you can do, especially if you go outside. Like what I found out when I was writing the book is there's so much science just in your backyard or if you're going out for your daily exercise in the park or, you know, by the pond or something like that. I went out to the park the other day. We've got like a little pond there. And there these pond skaters seem to be defying gravity, you know, because uh, they're floating on the water. They're walking on water. How is that possible? And you can then go home and you can recreate that phenomenon in your kitchen. So you can float a, a paperclip on the on the surface of a glass of water you have to do it in just the right way but there's these experiments you can do you can mimic the science uh, that these animals and plants are doing out in the wild there's lots of things that you could um uh, about a week ago we saw a spider and we we caught it just the moment when it was starting to build a web i don't know if you ever watched a spider building its own web like from scratch it's amazing it goes through all these different steps basically engineering it's not just science and the, the, the silk that the spider lays out and then it builds this spiral around and it sits in the middle waiting for a fly to come. It's amazing to watch. You can even do math while you're out there. Like if you pick up a pine cone or something like that, you can count the spirals of the, of the little knobbly bits on the pine cone. And they, they're always these special numbers in math that we call Fibonacci numbers. And, uh, and, and she can start to explore mathematics out there as well. Uh, we were looking at snails and the slime that they make. And then we went indoors and we started to make our own slime to see if we could overcome friction, which is what snails are doing when they make slime, you know. Well, I wanted to ask you about that because most things in the animal world are down to evolution, which means it must have a purpose. So what is the point of a snail's slime? You've hinted there it's to do with friction. Can you just tell us a little bit more? Yeah, of course. So uh, when two surfaces rub together, it, like there's friction. So if you try and rub your hands together, push your hands together really hard and then rub them, like it makes that nice noise. And it got, starts to get hot as well. That's because the, the, the energy that you're putting in is turning into heat, which is not what you want when you're trying to get around. You want to try and avoid friction if you can. So a snail wants to be able to slither along on the ground and friction is going to stop it from doing that. So what you do is you get these special molecules. They're called polymers. These really, really long molecules, if you've heard of molecules, and they slide around each other. These, these special molecules. And so you've got a layer of these slimy molecules in between 
the snail and the ground so it can just slide along, it can glide along. You mentioned energy there. Now, uh, yeah. I, obviously, I've got so many questions to ask you about the book, but I thought while we've got like a proper super scientist on, Steve, that I would, I would just chuck any odds and ends of sciencey questions that come into my brain and, and test you, really. Um, so yeah, great. Th- this, is, this is one I cannot get my head around. What actually is energy? What is it? It comes in so many different forms that we can measure. Yeah, kilowatts, calories, these are all things that we can measure. But but what actually is energy? Is it something tangible, something that we can we can grab hold of? That's a really good question. Energy, as you rightly say, comes in lots of different forms, which means you can store energy and use it later. So energy is like uh, the ability you can do work with energy. So for example, maybe I've got some energy stored as chemical energy in the form of fuel in my car. So there's energy stored inside the fuel and I can convert that energy into the energy of movement, right? So that's called kinetic energy. It's a different type of energy. I can convert the energy that's inside the, the petrol in my car into kinetic energy, in other words, the energy of my car moving. Uh, There's also something called gravitational potential energy. So I could convert the fuel in a rocket, let's say, into gravitational potential energy for the rocket. All that means is that I've lifted the rocket up. So I've converted the, or, you know, uh, if I stretch an elastic band, then I'm storing energy inside the elastic band. Suppose I make a catapult with my elastic band, you know, and I stretch the elastic band, it's storing energy. And then when I let go, that energy is being transferred out of the elastic band and it's going into whatever it was that I put in the catapult, you know, maybe a a stone or something like that. And the stone is flying through the air. It's got energy now. So yeah, it is this thing you can move around. And what we know about energy is you can use it to do stuff and you can convert it to all these different forms that we've discovered. You mentioned fuel there, that energy exists in fuel that we then burn in our cars. And this might be getting too abstract. Abstract, if you can't answer it, uh, then we'll move on. But what, <laughs> what, what kind of form is it taking, though? How is it just existing inside the fuel? Is it, 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 it's, it's, it's the same with the elastic band. What is going on? What I'm, I'm really trying hard to formulate yeah. the question. Is it like a, is it like a flow of this mystical uh, uh, air? What, what, what does it, what does it look like? What does it seem? Yeah, it's a good question. What I mean, you you can't see energy. Energy is like a, it's an amount of a, a thing, right? And it's a really abstract thing. You know, it's not like an amount of water. It's not like, you know, you can see sand in a bucket or something like that. It's like, I'm going to measure this thing and I'm going to do a few different measurements on it. By doing these different measurements, I can work out how much energy there is inside it. So in the case of fuel in a car, I'm really working out is how much energy gets released when I combine the, the, the molecules in the fuel with oxygen in the air because that's what you always do right if you've got fuel like that you burn it and all that means is it's reacting with oxygen in the air so you take the fuel and you combine it with oxygen and when they combine together that's what releases the energy from the from the fuel my last question about energy i promise I've been thinking all about solar <laughs> energy recently. I <laughs> know solar energy, uh-huh. stuff that's coming in from the sunlight, because we're really trying hard to utilize that uh, to be more efficient yeah. and to get loads more of these solar cells all over the place. But I was thinking, if we were suddenly to take so much of the sun's energy, um, uh, would would anything else be harmed? Because we're stealing the energy that they normally use, if that makes sense. Or is it, or is it just a tiny amount that that it's not noticeable for anything else because we know that no energy is wasted. Yeah. So, um, so it's, it's two things. It's what you say. It's a tiny amount. So we don't really need to worry about it, but think about what would happen. So you've got your solar panel on the ground, right? Think about if you took solar panel away, what would happen to that solar energy? Well, it would just hit the ground, wouldn't it? It would warm up the ground. So by putting a solar panel on the ground, 
all you're really doing is preventing the ground underneath the solar panel from getting slightly warmer. And is that something we need to worry about? Like, do we need to keep the ground warm? Well, <laughs> not really, because, because what happens is the energy that you collect from the solar panel will go on to power, say, a light bulb, and that light bulb will release, the, will release heat. So all the energy that hits the solar panel becomes heat eventually, but only after you've used it. So you don't need to worry about the energy hitting a solar panel being stolen from the earth because it'll turn into heat anyway, which is what it was going to do in the first place. It's just that we get to use it first. Uh, here is a question that's been sent over to the show by Dear Lynn. And remember, if you've got anything that you want answered, leave it as a review over on Apple Podcasts and I'll find it. Uh, Dylan asks, do animals have their own language? Uh, some animals seem to have their own language, but it's so not all animals. Some animals do, um, but they're much simpler than ours. So, for example, if you listen to birds singing, what you're really hearing is the birds communicating with each other. But it's not like sentences. They're not saying things like, oh, I was wondering what to have for dinner today. Maybe we could have worms. You know, it's not like that. It's it, worms they're saying again. something really basic. Yeah, not worms again. They're saying something much simpler. They're saying something like, go away, you know. Uh, because a lot, a lot of uh, bird song is territorial. They're basically saying, this is my spot. Um, they're not actually saying that, they're just making a sound and other birds know that that's what it means. Or they might be saying to their um, you know, brothers and sisters that are out there, look out, I've spotted a snake or something like that. So it's very limited what they can say, but they definitely have a language. Now, in the book Wild Scientist, uh, you've managed to cover all sorts of animals and you talk about how they use science to get through the day. So what animals are the physicists of the animal kingdom? What are the mathematicians? What are the inventors? What are the biologists? In your time, uh, Steve, kind of looking at all these different creatures, what's the most surprising bit of science that you found an animal uses uh, to, to get by and to exist? Oh, how could I choose the best one? Um, maybe my favorite is the bombardier beetle. So it's got, it does, it's got these dangerous chemicals in these two little sacks um, in its body, and it keeps the chemicals separate because as soon as the chemicals mix, they explode. So if the, the beetle's ever threatened by a predator or something like this, then it squirts the contents of the two sacks uh, into this sort of chamber where they mix together and then it explodes out of their bum and it, and it, and it fires at the predator and it's this boiling hot, acrid, stinky substance that comes out. Absolutely amazing chemical reaction. These really dangerous chemicals that, they, that, the, that the beetle has inside them all the time but just kept separate. Just, I mean, we, we, I mentioned it earlier to you with the with the the snail that these things evolved to become that, but the fact that they have evolved yeah. to get these like really toxic chemicals that are inside, and that's how they expel it, is is really is amazing. Um, Steve, thank you so much. The book is called Wild Scientists. Uh, it is phenomenal. Uh, you've answered so many like random abstract science questions. So, so thank you so much for going on, <laughs> uh, and have fun while you're stuck at home. Okay, Steve. Take care. For this week's Dangerous Dan, we've got one of the most beautiful, stunning snakes in the world that's also one of the most deadly. I mean, if you can call a snake beautiful, this one is that. It's the yellow-bellied sea snake. You find it around warm, tropical oceans, which is unlike most snakes. You don't really find them in the sea. It's got a jet black top with a bright yellow bottom, how it takes its name. Now, it's around most of the day. Uh, they don't only hunt at night. And now, normally, they're pretty docile. They kind of chill out. but And they only attack if a human gets too close. And when they attack, my word, <laughs> the venom packs a huge punch. Get this. It's said that just one drop of their venom can kill three grown men. And the way that it, it does the damage, it is pretty horrendous too. It, it attacks your breathing, it paralyzes you, it sears your muscles with a huge amount of pain, and it kicks in after about half an hour, which might be too late. Now you need to get an antidote quickly. 
but you still need more medical equipment to keep you around even when you've had the antidote. It's a horrendous thing to happen and it doesn't even end when you're cured. People who have been bitten by the yellow-bellied sea snake said that they've had pain all over for months afterwards too. It's time to get a brand new series on the show uh, and I'm starring in this one. It's not just me, it's also uh, the Thunderbirds. The Thunderbirds from Tracy Island. KO and Brains, they've agreed to take us, you and me, on a trip uh, to Tracy Island and also to the Red Planet to have a look at Mars and how scientists are trying to explore Mars and learn all we can. It's time we're taking a trip with Thunderbirds Argo, Mission to Mars. Thunderbirds Argo, Mission to Mars. The ExoMars mission to Mars looks fascinating. It's going to look for signs of life on the red planet. I have so many questions, I've posted a message online to see if anyone can help. Whoa! It's Thunderbird Shadow and Ko. You mean International Rescue Chief of Security, Carano? Oh, wow, yes, of course. Sorry, Chief. <laughs> it's okay. KO's just fine. Brains has been monitoring your posts and sees you've got a bunch of questions about the Exo Mars mission. Yeah, like how are they going to get to Mars? And they've got this rover with a bunch of instruments on it, like cameras and drills. How's that going to work? And will it ever come back? And what about... Okay, slow down. Why not come and see for yourself? Come with me. What? Into Thunderbird Shadow? Are we going to Tracy Island? Do I get to see the other Thunderbirds and meet the team and meet Max? <laughs> sure. How amazing is that? Thank you so much. Firstly, because we need to keep some secrets, you're going to have to wear this. Wow. A blindfold? No, that is absolutely cool with me. After all, it's not every day you get to go to the headquarters of the most famous interstellar rescue team in the universe. Now hold tight. Oh, oh my gosh. I can't believe I'm actually here on Tracy Island and inside Brain's lab. Oops. But please don't touch anything, Dan. For fun kids need you in one piece. And I need my lab equipment. Sorry. Wow. Brains. The legend himself. The one and only. And Max too. <laughs> one and only? I don't think the world is ready for two of me. <laughs> Although, if you like things in tattoos, the Exo Mars mission is right up your alley. Because the mission has been designed in two parts. One which took place in 2016. Why don't you tell Dan about the mission objectives? <laughs> First, search for signs of past life on Mars. Look for evidence of ice and water. It'll be testing for lots of different minerals too. <laughs> and analyze the atmosphere. So how's it going to do all that? How are they going to get onto the surface of Mars to start with? With this. Check out this hologram. It shows the craft that will carry a landing shuttle and a rover to Mars in a journey that will take nine months. Nine months? Wow. That's a long time to be away from home. The craft is unmanned. That means there aren't any astronauts on board. It'll be controlled from Earth, from launch to landing, and the rover which will be carrying out experiments will be remotely controlled as well. This is what the rover looks like. Whoa, the Exo Mars rover. Looks like a bigger version of you, Max. Although Max is quite unique and very special, the Exo Mars rover has even more tricks than Max up its sleeve. In the same way that our Thunderbird vehicles each have the different specialisms, the Rosalind Franklin rover, to use its full name, has been de designed to do some very particular jobs and we can tell you all about it. Come on, let me show you around. That's brilliant, thanks so much. And any chance of taking the controls of Thunderbird Shadow KO? That thing goes fast. I think it's probably better if you leave the flying to me, Dan. 
I don't want to have to explain to the fun kids boss that we lost you in an asteroid belt. Thunderbirds are go. Mission to Mars. With support from the UK Space Agency and International Rescue. Find out more at funkidslive.com slash space. Right, let's get this week's science in the news. Scientists say they've discovered a microbe that completely protects mosquitoes being infected by malaria. Now, this would have enormous potential to control the disease. It's one of the most dangerous in the world. Uh, You see the mosquitoes, they pass it on to each other, and then they pass it on to humans when they bite you. Uh, But after finding this blocking bug called Microsporidia MB and studying it on other mosquitoes, scientists think they've got a chance of getting on top of malaria. Brilliant news. Also something else that's good, experts are saying that nature can help your mood while you're stuck at home. They think a brief nature fix, just 10 minutes outside, uh, can massively lower your stress levels. By immersing ourselves in a rich coastline or wild forest, scientists say that we can feel more emotion, which can help us out right now. And finally, not so good news, a new study has said that more than 3 billion people will be living in places with too hot temperatures by the year 2070. They say unless greenhouse gases fall, large numbers of people will experience temperatures hotter than 29 degrees Celsius regularly, which is outside our regular climate. We will struggle to grow things, we'll struggle to live as well as we do right now. Scientists say that humans uh, will really find it tough to get by in that heat for long periods of time. And that is it for this week's Fun Kids Science Weekly. Thank you so much for listening. Loads more of the science series that we've heard today, including the brand new one, Thunderbirds I Go Mission to Mars, are on our website, funkidslive.com. Have a listen wherever you get your podcasts from and on the free Fun Kids app as well. Now, if the place where you get your podcasts is Apple Podcasts, make sure you uh, you leave your question, that your science question that you want answered as a review on there. If you can't do that, just fire an email over uh, over to me on the website. Uh, now, Fun Kids, we're a children's radio station from the UK. You can hear us all around the country on your DAB digital radio, on that free Fun Kids app, and as always at funkidslive.com.